Aloha, this is Jason from Hawaii. Welcome to a very special edition of the Comics for Fun and Profit podcast. In this episode, I will be interviewing Chris Doc White and Gavin Hignight to promote the Prisoner Retro Style Action Figures Kickstarter campaign that is currently going on. Um, it's from one Wandering Planets um, Toys. The Kickstarter will end on May 26. Now, guys, did I um, did I get the um, the toy company name correct? I'm sorry. Yeah, Wandering yeah, we're excited. Planet. Yeah, Wandering Planet Toys. Okay. All right. Now, for the listeners, um, I'm going to give you guys. I'm going to give a a little bit of history, uh, you know, background history. So, so Chris Stockwhite is a writer, producer, filmmaker, and was a nominee with Sean Covell for an Independent Spirit Award back in 2005. He produced the movie Napoleon Dynamite back in 2004, um, Broken Hill in 2009, co-starring, co-starring Timothy Hutton, and uh, more recently, 11-11 in 2018. He has produced and correct me if I'm wrong, Doc, um, and written some um, cart- animation cartoons such as Napoleon Dynamite in 2012, Avengers Assemble from 2014 to 2015. And I love that show. That was, I really love that. Transformer Rescue Bots Academy from 2019 to 2020, um, Ninjango um, from 2020 to current day. So, Doc, did I miss anything on your part? Uh, I mean, that uh, you hit the highlights there. That's great. Okay. And then, Gavin, for you, you are a writer, producer, filmmaker, and music video director. Your animation credits are Star Wars Resistance, Transformers Cyberverse, um, and also um, Am- the Amazon Emmy-nominated Lost in Oz. Now, you also have written some comics, correct? Like Motor City and the webcomic The Concrete World. And the last thing I'm going to point out, Gavin, is that you produce and directed music videos for legendary filmmaker John Carpenter. Um, one the music video called "Night" and "Utopian Facade." Gavin, did I miss anything, or do I need to be corrected on anything? Oh well, I wouldn't say corrected, but I always always add uh, the 2012 Ninja Turtles, uh, Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles, because that was one of my favorite gigs I've ever done, and. It's actually one that Doc did as well. Mm-hmm. Um, that that show was just a joy and uh, uh, always for me a career highlight that I like to talk about. But yeah, and then also uh, in addition to all that fun writing stuff, uh, had that opportunity to uh, John Carpenter is a you know an idol and a hero, yes. um, and it was really really cool to be able to uh, yeah make a couple videos. Uh, that you knew were going to be awesome because it was for his music. So the, yeah, even if the video, uh, the visuals were no good, it's still going to be good because the soundtrack was, was him. <laughs> yeah. Um, I'm going to touch up on that in a little bit, Gavin, the music video. Okay. So um, I'm going to give a big shout out to David Hyde of Superfan Promotions for setting up this interview. So David, thank you very much. Okay. Yeah. Thank you, David. Shout out. Okay. So I'm going to start the interview guys. So where can listeners follow you, follow you guys on social media? Uh, I'll let you jump on that, Doc. Uh, I'm on Twitter uh, at Otherland71. And then uh, I'm on, uh, best places to find me is on Twitter, uh, mm-hmm. just Gavin Hignite, my name smashed together. And then uh, I think more fun than my Twitter is Instagram. I do a lot of toy photos and just more visual person. So, and it's just, uh, Instagram Gavin Hignite. Mm-hmm. Oh, and I, uh, and most importantly, uh, wandering planet toys. Uh, yeah. uh, so Twitter is wandering planet and mm-hmm. Instagram is wandering planet underscore toys. And then Gavin, I want to point out, you also have a website too. Yeah. Yeah. You know, I, I put together a website. Uh, I think when I was, a little younger in my career and really trying to do a lot of visual like directing stuff. It was supposed to be a destination for, you know, like, but you know, now that the, you know, YouTube has evolved into what it has. I just have a YouTube channel that I put all the stuff I make up on and really the website's just so, you know, someone Googles it's, it's a hub to tell you where to go. The thing is, because I'm going to point out because I, because I want to, I caught a, um, 
I caught a short clip of your music video, uh, Night. That was great. Oh, yeah. I love oh, it. Oh, thank you. It, it, you know, it, it was kind of like an opening. It literally was like an opening to a John Carpenter movie. It was, it was just perfect. I thought that's, it was. Oh, thank you. I mean, that's really what we were really trying to go for is, is just the, the kind of atmosphere that he evokes. Mm -hmm. um, and, and, you know, we, we wanted to leave it kind of open-ended, uh, you know, so it matches, you know, one of the, the things that he had said about those albums mm -hmm. is that it was me a soundtrack uh, for the movies and people's minds. Yes. And I feel like the, you know, that song, when I heard it, it, it struck a chord with me very deeply. And, and that was the movie that appeared in, in my mind, you know, mm -hmm. thanks to the music. So, yeah. yeah. So listeners, if you guys get a chance, you know, check out Gavin's website for that music video. Okay, so I'm going to go into your guys' origins and we'll try, you know, um, just a brief background origin story. So where did you guys grow up? I grew up uh, just outside of Atlanta, Georgia, mm -hmm. a suburb of Atlanta, Georgia called Marietta. Uh, and that was, uh, that, and we didn't move around a lot. I was in one house until I was 18. Mm -hmm. And then I grew up probably somewhat similarly. I was in a suburb of Denver, uh, in Colorado, uh, called Westminster. And uh, I'm sure you may have heard of Boulder, Colorado. It's pretty yes. pretty popular. But I was halfway between Denver and Boulder, so I kind of got the the best of both. You know, uh, uh, at the time I, I was growing up, Boulder was very. Uh, it wasn't as 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 tech as it is now. It was still a very college town and kind of you know post hippie culture. Um, like Allen Ginsberg has an institute there and stuff. So yeah, I was exposed to a lot of cool, mm -hmm. um, you know, counterculture stuff, mm -hmm. uh, even though I was like a suburban kid. All right. Um, what was your guy's first comic book or pop culture experience? Oh, wow. <laughs> what was it? Uh, <laughs> I mean, hell, man, I grew up, my first theater experiences were Star Wars and Raiders of the Lost Ark and Tron, and, you know, stuff like Transformers and G.I. Joe was on TV. So I, how could I not be doing what I do now, right? Um, my uh, first issue, my, the first comic book I ever collected uh, was... Uh, I was uh, I was in a 7-Eleven with my dad, mm -hmm. and I saw the cover of there was an Amazing Spider-Man cover mm -hmm. where Peter Parker is standing over Aunt May's grave. Mm -hmm. um, it's it's actually um, it's issue 196 of Amazing, and this cover sort of blew my mind. Mm -hmm. And uh, I asked my dad for it. Uh, you know, I think it cost like 40 cents. Yes. And that was my first comic, and uh, that started my collection. Oh, my God. Okay. Now, um, talk about your guys' love for toys. Yeah. Um, geez. Uh, <laughs> yeah, I, you know, I, I just, I think they're conduits to, to being creative and imagination, especially like action figures and, and stuff that, you know, is tangible that a kid, or in our case, adults can have in their hand. Um, so, you know, like I said, I grew up during a very heavily action figure era. Mm -hmm. um, and, and I think it just stuck. And I think that, that as a child and, a, you know, playing with those toys and stuff really fired up my imagination in, in a way that it still hasn't stopped. And I'm just very appreciative of it and try to, you know, now that, you know, I'm older and writing this stuff. I'm just trying to keep that cycle going for young minds to be able to enjoy like I did. Yeah, I agree. I mean, I think that I grew up in the eighties and uh, the, like Gavin, you know, uh, and um, it was the golden age of toys. Like it was, you know, it was Transformers and Joe Joe and it was, um, it, uh, you know, it was Voltron and it was like everything else, you know? Mm -hmm. And I think that the way that we, because you don't really have, have toy collectors. You, there are not many toy collectors that come from before that generation, right? That uh -huh. generation really kind of made toy collecting a thing for, for more than just kids. And I think that that, uh, for us, it was sort of like getting introduced to a new medium, yeah. like in the sense that like when a, a, the first time a painter gets to play with paint, 
-hmm. or the first time uh, you know someone who sketches in charcoal picks up a piece of charcoal mm -hmm. um, that we as kids like we made stories with to toys with Optimus Prime and um, with the other toys that we had we that's how we built stories as as eight-year-olds and ten-year-olds uh, and it was the way you know way other kids would make stories with pens or pencils or crayons we made stories with toys and we toys became the medium through which we explored the world of storytelling and then now to this day i mean gavin and i have written together for iron man for teenage mutant ninja turtles for star wars resistance for transformers for spider-man and in a way we're still using those same skills we developed in our living rooms playing with those toys that we had in the 80s you know, absolutely yeah, and I'll, I'll add to that mm -hmm. you know this weird medium point and I'm, I'm sure doc probably had this too is uh role-playing games you know for me it was like you know uh, uh action figures and toys and stuff was like i don't know high school for the or, i don't know maybe like grade school for the imagination and then you know like got into like being around like 14 years old and my brother and his friends were a little older and playing stuff like Star Frontiers or Dungeons and Dragons or Chill. And so then I got to, you know, tag along and play with them. And it finer tuned role playing and getting into character or characters, voices and stuff. Mm -hmm. So it, it definitely was like um, the right preparation to just keep going and do what Doc and I do now. Yeah. So I'm going to um, I'm going to ask, how did you guys meet? It was on uh, with a, it was the first show we did together it was called Iron Man Armored Adventures. We both were freelancers writing on that for a story editor named Brandon Allman. And uh, he, when we were doing season two of the show, Brandon did a, wanted all the, the freelancers to meet. Mm -hmm. And so we went to the Pig and Whistle over by the Egyptian uh, in uh, Hollywood. And we met, uh, I met up with a bunch of freelancers that have been writing on that show that I, that are still my friends to this day. And it was like a big day, but that's where Gavin and I met. And I think one of the first things, one of the first things Gavin never said to me was like, we went inside to grab our food or something. And, uh, and Gavin said to me, yeah, I'm working on a, 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 a self-published indie cyberpunk comic. Mm -hmm. And I was like, dude, this guy's cool. <laughs> like, I'm just, I'm like this, I'm gonna be friends with this guy. Like that is like, like, that's a cool thing to just say to say to a person. Mm -hmm. uh, I had to, and I was making it up. I had no no comic to back it up. I just wanted to impress Doc. But <laughs> 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 no, I'm kidding. Uh, that's uh, the concrete world is is uh, uh, what what we speak of there. Yeah. Uh -huh. okay. And then um, let's see. Um, before I continue on, Doc, how did you get how did how did you get that nickname? Oh well. Yeah. In, in, in grad school, I was a little bit of a, of a know-it-all. Uh -huh. uh, I, I corrected the professors on some stuff. You know? <laughs> and, and I sort of got, uh, so they're, they're like, they were like, that's sort of the nickname I got. Okay. Yeah. All He's right. actually the um, 15th regeneration of Doctor Who. <laughs> and we just, we call him Doc for short. And he'll reveal that one of these days. I'm actually one of the previously unknown yeah. doctors. A, a secret regeneration, yeah. I'm one of the Mobius doctors. <laughs> <laughs> All right. And then, um, so, um, so how, you know, what is the origin story of Wandering Planet Toys? How did that come about? Uh, that's, that's a newer origin story, and it's, uh, man, we're really excited about it. So, you know, we're both creatives. We, we both, you know, um, a, as a hobby, you know, still enjoy collecting toys and stuff. Yes. And um, I, I, I think there's part of my personality that if I love something long enough, I feel like I want to participate and do it. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, Kickstarter and uh, just like advances in technology, mm -hmm. we've, we've, met and or been fans or customers or backers of some really talented folks who are just making it happen, you know, who are bringing like into indie toys, indie toys is a thing now. Yes. And um, thanks to crowdfunding and uh, you know, these people who have pushed the envelope 
and I just was starting to get the itch to maybe try and make something. Uh -huh. And uh, at the same time, uh, trying to figure out what, what was it you know I wanted to do, what was within my means, or or what what was interesting enough to me to stick with it. Uh -huh. And uh, I don't know. Uh, I uh, Doc will and will speak to this. He's been a lifelong prisoner fan. Mm -hmm. I got into it much later. Yes, and. Uh, and I've, and I may have said this somewhere else before, but being a fan of something, I, I want a souvenir of it. You know, I, like if I like something, I, I seek out, you know, and I want to have it on my shelf or, I, I, you know, and we just didn't have that for the prisoner. Uh -huh. um, there's not a lot of merchandising that was ever done. Uh -huh. And it just kind of clicked. And, and um, knowing, you know, Doc's love of toys and, and his, his knowledge of the prisoner, uh -huh. um, you know, I brought it up. And, yes. and then kind of the rest is, is history. Like he, uh, the enthusiasm that Doc brought towards making Prisoner reality, mm -hmm. um, you know, filled the sails, right? Like, I, you know, yes. of, of the ship and, and here we are. So Doc, before you start, let me just um, let our um, listeners know. So The Prisoner is a classic 1960s TV show that starred Patrick McGowan. You know, for me, the first time I saw actor Patrick McGowan was in the movie Silver Street. That was the first Gene Wilder, Richard Pryor team up. He played the bad guy, uh, Roger Devereaux. You know, to, fat, to um, other, to younger listeners, he's, um, Patrick McGowan is better known to Braveheart fans. He was King Edward Longshanks. And also Patrick McGowan's, basically his last TV role was he he did the voice for his role of number six in The Simpsons. The episode title was called The Computer War Menace Shoe. That was his final TV um, role. Now, I'm going to point back to you, Doc. Can you tell the fans what is The Prisoner about? Just go for it. Absolutely. So The Prisoner uh, is a British uh, TV show from... 1967 that's sort of part spy show part sci-fi part avant-garde sort of um you know experimental filmmaking it, it, it's just kind of a, a genre busting mind-bending uh a, a series that is ostensibly about a um unknown unnamed you never know his name british uh, intelligence uh, agent who resigns his position uh, with the British government and uh, who storms out of the office uh -huh. uh, and uh, he's packing up like he's going to leave the country or something and he gets uh, drugged and abducted and when he wakes up he thinks he's just back in his apartment but when he goes to look out the window it's not his apartment he sees that he's actually in a bizarre little village, a, a beautiful but almost hauntingly so little village. And he runs out into the village and he says, where am I? And everyone says, the village. And he asks for a map of the village and it's just sort of a, a map that just shows the buildings of the village and says, map of your village. And he gets a taxi to try to drive out of the village and they say, local service only. And he, uh, everything is purchased in credit units. Um, and there's no, so you don't know what currency it is and people speak different languages. So you're not sure what country you're in. And uh, what it turns out is that he has been an unknown conspiracy has abducted him and put him in this village because they want to know why he retired. He has a secret that they need to know and they want information. And so the series, which is only 17 minutes, uh, sorry, 17 episodes long, so it's very bingeable, is about the village trying to break number six. They replaced his name with a number. You never know what his actual name is. And, the, uh, and he's assigned number six, and it's about the village trying to break number six. And the head of the village is a character named number two. And so the big question is always, who is number one? If this is number two, who's running things? Who's number one? But the thing about number two is that number two changes. Uh, almost every episode is a different number two. In fact, sometimes there are multiple number twos in every episode, as if the organization that runs the village is constantly replacing the leadership. Um, but all of them try these crazy mind games 
to, to break number six, they, these crazy interrogation techniques, um, and number six uh, is defiant and tries to resist all of these efforts. Now, I'm going to ask both of you guys, um, what was your first exposure or experience um, with the prisoner? The TV well, for me, what it was is I grew up in Georgia and uh, Georgia Public Broadcasting aired it after Doctor Who. Um, so, you know, I would I would watch Doctor Who every week and then uh, they started putting on The Prisoner and uh, I must have been, I must have been 10 or 11 years old mm -hmm. and uh, it absolutely blew my mind because it is... Uh, I, like it's on the well, I gave a very ex sort of straightforward explanation about what it is, but there's sort of more to it than that. There's some really bizarre stuff. I mean, it was sort of, you know, Twin Peaks before Twin Peaks mm -hmm. in some episodes, you know, and uh, and it just blew my mind. I don't think I'd ever seen anything like it. It felt very allegorical. Like it felt like it was making statements about things bigger than just the show itself and. Uh, and it just was something, uh, just, I was just immediately captivated. What about yeah, and, and I'd say for me, it's, a, you know, a, a definitely a different, um, you know, it came to me differently. Uh, I was probably about five years ago, maybe six. Uh, I was in a writer's room uh, and we were, we had some downtime where our, our brains were tired and uh, the, the showrunner on that show, Randolph, uh, was, you know, uh, he's a lifelong fan. And we were talking about something, and, and it reminded him of the show. And he's like, I got to show you these opening credits. I've got to show you what the show looks like. Mm -hmm. And uh, we watched it, and I was, I, I'm already a, a pretty big fan of classic television and, um, and, and, and independent film. And this show feels like the best of both. You know, it's, 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 it's made outside of the system in, in a way. Um, I mean, just the, the, the thinking of it. And huh? I think I very instantly was drawn to it, the, that it was just such a passion project for Patrick huh? McGowan and that, you yeah. know, he using his star power from his previous series and, and, you know, was like, I'm going to make this thing that like how the heck did it get on television right because it is so out there and it is so avant-garde and you know you you have this passionate person behind it who who wrote it who starred in it who produced it who yes. you know um it, it really is a labor of love and, and you feel it in every frame of of the film um and and like doc said it it, it pushes you to to ponder and, and think about things much larger than it. And I think that's one of the reasons it's so timeless mm -hmm. and why, you know, Doc, as, as a, you know, uh, a kid, right, Doc? I mean, you were young or me as a, 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 presumably an adult. Um, we, there's magic in it no matter the age you are when you discover it. So I, I think that's, you know, and, and now, you know, our, our Kickstarter's been running and, and We've, we've been meeting all these amazing prisoner fans and it's interesting that that you know that synergy is not lost um no matter who who it is who's drawn to it mm -hmm. um it's very interesting um so uh be, you know um let me just share you a little bit about my background about the prisoner because i think it was in the 80s and i i want to say i think it was like a star log magazine that i read about it and um i mean i I rented video, just some, you know, whatever videos they had at this movie museum, movie museum that was like a, like an independent, the, small independent theater with um, videotapes for rentals. And, you know, I watched a couple of episodes of The Prisoner and I loved it. Um, and, you know, to prepare for, you know, our interview today, you know, uh, I went on Amazon Prime and for listeners, if you are, you know, if, you know, if you're a fan of the show or if you're a newcomer interested in the show, it's, you know, on Amazon Prime, you know, it's free for, with commercials. Also, you can stream it um, on paid premium services like Shout Factory, Tubi, and uh, Plate, uh, Pluto TV. So, again, when I was watching at least a couple of the episodes yesterday, it still draws you in. And what's really nice is, um, you know, Gavin, like you said, it's, it's um the filming it's still clear 
I, I, I don't know how to explain it. They, they, I don't, I don't, I don't think, I don't know if they ever remastered it or anything, but it, it's, you know, it, it's really clear. And like you said, Patrick McGowan put his heart into it because when you watch the episodes, there's some things where it's like the Rover ball, you know, he put that in there for a reason. So, and that is pretty cool. Yeah. 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 The, um, uh, the timelessness of, because the village is kind of a place where you, you don't know where, where or when you are. Uh -huh. And I think that really helps the show remain relevant. Yeah. So, but yeah. And then, um, let me see. One, one, and then also to, yeah. So, and then also too is, um, also too that also, I think the, you know, like Patrick McGowan put it, um, like for, um, he did it for a specific, he just, he, it was a complete story for the 60s. And that's something very highly, you know, um, um, highly um, unusual back then for the 60s, you know. Oh, totally, totally, yeah. right? Like, like, like a serialized television show that, you know, has Some a beginning, middle, and end. Yeah. yeah. Oh, I'm sorry, what was that? Yeah, that that he that actually comes to an end. Yeah, that yeah. was old. Well, I you know he had done he just the series he was just coming off of was called Danger Man. Mm -hmm. Though it aired in the United States as a Secret Agent Man, it aired in some other countries under some mm -hmm. other names, um, where he played a Secret Service agent named John Drake, and uh, he it was su a super popular show mm -hmm. all around the world. And at the time, newspapers reported him as the highest paid actor in Britain. Um, uh, though he contested that it was not the case, but that's, but you know, maybe he was lying or maybe the newspapers were, I don't know. But he was one of the biggest stars uh, uh, in the world at the time. And he could have just gone on making more Danger Man. I'm sure the producer of Danger Man would have really liked that. But instead he went to the guy that ran uh, ITV at the time, this guy named Lord Gray, uh, Lou Grade, sorry, Lord Lou Grade. And uh, he went to him and he said, um, you know, this is the show I want to make. Mm -hmm. uh, and he wanted to make seven episodes. Yeah. And Lou Grade said, this is great, but you got to make 26 so I can sell it to America. Mm, yeah. Uh, and uh, they settled on 17. And, um, and it, you know, everyone was so surprised that he was sort of turning his back on a, a successful show mm -hmm. uh, in order to do something new. But um, he knew that's what he wanted to make. Yeah. But I think also, too, I'm wondering if he kind of knew that if he, and I'm sorry, I know you guys are both writers, and, and forgive me for saying this, but I, I'm wondering if he knew that, you know, if he tried to make it longer, it'll just, you know, the, the, the story would get weaker or they, you know, Oh yeah, it dies out, right? Yeah, yeah, it loses its, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. I mean, yeah. I think as, as writers, we know that <laughs> very well. Yeah. Because it's, it's a fear and the anxiety to, yeah, if you have something that's working, it's not, it's not going to work forever, you know? Yes. Mm -hmm. okay. All right. So now I'm going to ask, um, how did you guys um, come up with the idea of producing, you know, the first wave of the prisoner action figures? Now, it's uh, three and three quarter action figures. And correct me if I'm wrong, it's a five point articulation, correct? Yes, sir. So can you guys talk about how you guys, you know, decided to do the prisoner action figure? What was the process of like going, getting the licensing, you know, from beginning, you know, start to end product? Uh, well, I'll say, you know, for the toys, um, we, we both, you know, we both knew we wanted something. We, we wanted to, to make something that felt like the toys you never got from the series, right? Like we, the goal was, you know, like say if I went on eBay and I was like, oh, you know, I, I really like the show The Prisoner. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, what, what toys did they make for it? And then you find out they didn't. Yeah. So we wanted to fill that gap. That was the appeal of doing something kind of retro. And, you know, granted, uh, when the show was on, uh, you know, it w that era was more like the 12-inch G.I. Joe or, yeah. you know. Um, but for us, I think maybe just because, you know, when we grew up and, and what was appealing, that Kenner Star Wars type vibe felt right to approach. And also as an indie toy company that's just starting out, mm -hmm. um, it, it just it seems safer to go uh, in that direction. You know, we, we could make a lot out of that vibe 
versus, you know, trying to do something different that um, might not pull off as well. Um, Doc, I'll let, I'll let you speak further to it. Yeah, I mean, I think that's exactly it, at least for me personally, because there are a lot of prisoners fan, prisoner fans who were there from the beginning. At 16, mm-hmm. In 1967, it aired on U.S. Uh, on US airwaves uh, the summer. It was a summer replacement series. Uh, for 16 weeks, they they didn't air one of them in the U.S. But um, uh, you know, but immediately, almost it got repeats also in the U.K. And so there are 60s fans, but I think there are a lot of fans of um, my era who found the show, at least in the U.S., who found the show through PBS that started airing it in the 80s. Mm-hmm. And so in, in my mind, this is like I discovered the show in the 80s. And these were the kinds of toys, these retro five point articulated mm-hmm. figures, the kinds of toys I was playing with in the 80s. So I, for me, the connection seems natural, like that this is the toy that would have happened in the era when I found the show. Mm-hmm. Um, and, uh, you know, so that's, that's why it feels emotionally right to me. Oh, okay. No. And, and then for the, the business side of it, you know, um, Doc and I both working, uh, you know, with the companies that we have and in the capacity of producers and stuff. It was just, you know, a matter of, you know, we had to find out who, who owned the rights at the time. And, uh, you know, did it, had, had anyone else already secured toy rights that would prevent us from pursuing this? Mm-hmm. Um, and that was all new, very new territory, uh, especially for me. Mm-hmm. Um, but we, we found our way to ITV, who, you know, still owns it. Mm-hmm. And um, they've just been fantastic. Uh, uh, they've, I think one of the things that's been great about them is, uh, you know, they're very protective over the prisoner. They, they, they want, you know, things need to be, it has to be done right, you know. And that's the kind of partner you want on a project is one that understands, you know, the creative that they own. Mm-hmm. and wants to protect it and uh, heighten it. So the, the type of notes that we've been given um, from them uh, have just elevated uh, the project and, and helped us fine tune uh, on that side, on like that kind of businessy, you know, the boring stuff you don't want to talk about. Um, mm-hmm. It has been, has been very good. Uh, and then we've, we've had just great, great um, exposure to the minds of, of other indie toy creators who have been very forward with us and very honest and hopefully have avoid, helped us to avoid, you know, some pitfalls and some traps as you set out to do this for the first time as a, as an indie producer. Okay. Um, now, you know, in this Kickstarter, like I said, this is the first wave, you know, you have some of the figures, you know, number six from the arrival, um, number six from checkmate, the, uh, two pack of number six and number two from free for all, you know, how did you guys decide what episode and, and the characters you guys wanted in the first wave set? How did that come about? Well, the schizoid man was a no brainer. Um, schizoid man is, is absolutely a fan favorite episode. It's Patrick McGowan playing off Patrick McGowan in the, you know, uh, it, it, the, in ostensibly, Without giving away spoilers, uh, uh, one of the tricks the village tries to use is to bring in a dead ringer for number six, somebody who looks just like him, and then try to screw around with number six's mind uh, Mm -hmm. if he really is who he thinks he is and that kind of stuff. They they play identity politics with him. Yeah, it's 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 like an evil twin episode turned on its head. It's so brilliant. Yeah, it's really wonderful, and. they um uh so it was sort of a no-brainer to do it especially because uh you know it's a repaint of the figure you know one of them is sort of a black jack with a white trim and the other one has a white jack with a black trim Mm -hmm. uh but uh, so it was a no-brainer to do that that was absolutely something we immediately thought of okay and then um let's see um, oh, and then free for all. The other episode yeah, yeah. is free for all, uh, and uh, that's. Uh, I mean, that episode just seems so relevant. It's about the way that that honestly, it's about the way that people try to subvert the democratic process, mm-hmm. and that's something that just seems more relevant today than when when Patrick Gowen made that episode. And, and so, and plus, there's some fun accessories that you can make with it. So, on a toy level, that was like, a, okay, well, yeah, we're gonna do free for all. 
Yeah, and for me, uh, that particular episode, you know, the prisoner is is kind of a confusing series on purpose. You know, you you're not given everything. You you're as you know, you're in the dark just as number six is in the dark. Mm -hmm. And by the time I got to that episode in viewing is I think when I kind of fell in love with the show is when I realized it was a special show unlike others. So um, I just have a real a fondness uh, for free for all. And uh, Eric Portman, who portrays number two is he's just a delight. And to be able to, you know, kind of pay tribute to him and, number two action figure form was pretty awesome i watched that episode yesterday it was great you know awesome. you know and i love the part where it's like you know um number six is trying to get drunk you know he and then yeah. they take him to a place where there's a cave <laughs> yeah. and there's another customer in there and who is it the customer it's number two <laughs> yeah that was that's a great scene yeah and and you know uh uh uh, Jason, one of the things that, that you reminded me of earlier, too, is I, and I'm starting to just understand this now. This is a show that it kind of does get better with repeat viewing, right? Like when you revisit an episode, you really, I don't know, there's, there's a magic to rewatching these. I mean, in that, I guess that's part of its legacy. Mm -hmm. Like, yeah, it's, um, I, like I said, I don't, I don't know what it is. I, it, it's, you know, um, Gavin, like he said, you know, um, so it's interesting because the sh to me the show is well written, you know, but it, and you know it's you know it, it can be a little confusing. Not all the questions are answered, but yet there's something that still draw it still draws me in. You know, oh. I was not bored with rewatching it. It was still going. This is so cool. I'm still trying to figure out what's going on, but it's still keeping me hooked. And I totally, and you and you still worry about him. You're still invested. Yeah even though like you may have watched all 17 and though it's, it's very interesting. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Sorry. I'm going to continue on guys because I know yeah. we've got it because I'm, I'm trying to keep, I'm trying to keep you guys on a schedule. Um, can you guys talk about, um, you know, have you guys met all your stretch goals? You know, is there any Ooh. secret <laughs> one that we haven't met yet? Now, before I continue on, I just want to let listeners know that, uh, um, correct me if I'm wrong. You guys are fully funded already, correct? The pro the campaign's already fully funded, correct? Yep. Yeah. These boys are happening. Thanks so much to some awesome uh, Kickstarter contributors. The toys are going to be a reality. Mm -hmm. um, we have we've put out two stretch goals, and our our backers have obliterated and crushed both stretch goals. Um, we are right now in the middle of a process of getting approval for. Uh, a third stretch goal um, that we are very excited about that we have not announced because um, because the approval we're, we're because we're officially licensed and our partners at ITV Studios need to look at everything and see everything. Uh, it is absolutely a process that doesn't always move quickly, um, but we have a stretch goal we are very very excited about that we can't wait to share with people. And we're just waiting for that approval to come through. We hope it'll be at the top of uh, this coming week. Oh, that'd be cool. Um, I'm sorry, I'm gonna go back. So can you at least talk to, uh, let our listeners know what stretch goals have already been reached already? For sure. Uh, so the first that was unlocked uh, was a, a penny farthing mm -hmm. uh, figure stand. Uh, mm -hmm. And, you know, as, as fans of the series know, uh, the penny farthing is, is one of the most important symbols of the show. Mm -hmm. um, and so it only seemed right to have a figure stand um, you know, with it. Uh, the, the second stretch goal equally is important to the show, if not absolutely, is Rover. Rover is a character to itself. And whenever Doc and I brought up, oh, we're gonna try to make these prisoner toys, Mm -hmm. to like fellow friends or toy collectors the first thing that came out of everyone's mouth is are you going to make the white ball mm -hmm. <laughs> and you know i think some people were teasing and some people were serious but yeah heck yeah you know we, we you got to have a little rover to chase around your little number six mm -hmm. uh and uh i honestly when we conceived that idea i was hoping we would get there as a stretch goal i you know you, you hope for the best 
And as Doc said, our, our backers have been just outstandingly supportive and we, we got to Rover really quickly. And so I'm so excited it'll be part of, um, you know, part of the, the toy line. And then I'm going to, either one of you guys, can you guys explain, you know, um, I, I mean, Gavin, I know what you're talking about when you say the Rover and stuff, but can you guys explain to like listeners who are not familiar with the show, like what the Rover is and the Penny Farthing? Sure, I think Doc could speak better to that. Uh, well, Penny Farthing is just, uh, everyone knows what they are. They not, may not know the name of it, but they're um, uh, old timey bicycles that had one large wheel on the front and one small wheel on the back. So you've seen people ride them. They look sort of Victorian and silly uh, mm -hmm. in modern, you know, in contemporary, sort of through contemporary eyes. They were though at the time, marvels of modern technology because they were speed bikes. Mm -hmm. um, because there weren't different gearing on bicycles, the larger wheel in the front made uh, like a, the, made the, the ratio of the, the um, because you couldn't switch gears at the time, they hadn't figured that out yet, but it made the, the force ratio different so that the pedaling, the same force of pedal got you a faster speed. So mm -hmm. they were these speed bikes and they were kind of dangerous. They were easy to fall off of because the large wheel made balancing even harder. And uh, so uh, for Patrick McGowan, as he was creating the series and he wrote m and directed many episodes, sometimes under pen names, um, and uh, for him, uh, the penny farthing was a symbol of progress. Mm -hmm. It was speeding into the future. And so you see penny farthings, uh, the, the, the end credits of the show is a penny farthing sort of slowly sort of being built. And uh, you'll see penny farthings in various places in various episodes. And it's important to pay attention to them because you know, for, mm -hmm. you know, of where they are and what they mean uh, in those scenes. Uh, so that is very much a symbol. The penny farthing is also on the buttons that they wear, the ones with your numbers. When they take away your name and give you a number, the, the button that the number is on has a penny farthing symbol on it, uh, symbol of progress. Um, and so, or what the village considers progress. Uh, and so that's, that's very important. Then also Rover was the guardian of the village. Basically, if anyone tried to escape, there would be a, uh, it, it looked like a sort of a, a, a white um, translucent sort of sphere that would glow, would, it could be various sizes and it would inflate and it could come and just kind of like smother people and capture people. It had this creepy, almost electronic roaring sort of noise that it made and um, and uh, it was just sort of a super haunting and almost surreal element of the show. The first time you see it in the first episode called Arrival, uh, number two speaks and then everyone in the whole village freezes, like they just freeze. And then you see the, this, uh, this, this white ball sort of inflate out of a fountain. They seem to always come from water or be associated with water and, and it overcomes this guy who tries to run because presumably he's done something wrong and he's been caught. Uh, and the the prisoner sees all this. Number six sees all this. And but Rover is sort of a haunting. It moves strangely. It was actually just a a weather balloon. They had been trying to build uh, a more advanced sort of electronic cart kind of thing mm -hmm. with with different gizmos, and the thing kept not working. And then the crew, Patrick and the crew, were out scouting in Wales where they shot the show and saw a weather balloon. And uh, they were like, "What's that?" And Patrick McGowan was like, get me one of those. And they ran off and got him one. And that's what wound up being the rover. That is so, that's a cool background, backstory. You know, because again, Patrick McGowan, to me, when, you know, when I see him, he's like this, he seems like one of those, those typical British actor, you know, um, kind of high prestige. And then for him to go, give me a weather balloon, you know, <laughs> <laughs> You know what I'm saying? Because I mean, for yeah. because I've seen the episodes and I'm kind of going, oh my God, I can't believe this, you know, the rover is kind of like in the episode, the first episode is kind of like beating him down on the beach. Yeah, you know, I love that. And, and that's him writing this, that this is what's going to happen. You know, so th I just think that's pretty cool. Okay, sorry guys. I'm going to continue on. Um, now, let's say if someone misses out on this Kickstarter, and, and I'm not trying to make fun of anybody, but let's say, you know, there's a, there's a prisoner fan 
that has no, no idea about this Kickstarter and they either listen to, you know, this episode, the Comics for Fun and Profit episode or John Suntress's Word Balloon episode that you guys were on. Let's say they listen to it like sometime in August or something. Right. You go, oh my God, I miss, how can I get one of these action figures? You know, it, so can you guys explain like what happens if someone misses out on this Kickstarter? Yeah, so um, it's interesting because I think even three weeks ago, four weeks ago, we might have had a different answer to this. Um, the the just massive amount of support we've seen and the backers who have come to to really make this uh, a, a really you know successful launch for us for toys. Mm -hmm. um, uh, it's it's going to uh, enable us like we're we're already in conversation with a uh with one of our favorite online uh e-tailers mm -hmm. who are interested in carrying the figures um so yeah we, we hope you know to be able to make them available mm -hmm. after kickstarter um to you know uh you know select online uh retailers who, who do toys and stuff yeah. uh there will of course be items in the Kickstarter that we're not going to remake, like the arrival um, is an exclusive uh, for the Kickstarter launch. Uh, you know, just to kind of say thanks to those who came on early and yes. are making it happen with us. Mm -hmm. um, we are, are very, 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 very closely looking at the details of trying to do wave two for everyone. Mm -hmm. um, there are some fan favorites we were not able to look at doing uh, in wave one, uh, just because we're, we're new and small and we need to be very strategic. Um, so, you know, if we, and it looks like we're going to be able to do a wave two, um, you know, do we do another version of number six in that wave, uh, uh -huh. with a different card? So if you missed him the first time around, you can still get him uh -huh. and add him to say new characters we're going to explore. Um, so, you know, that's, that's kind of in a nutshell. We, we hope uh, prisoner fans are finding out about us. We, we, you know, word of mouth has been great. The mm -hmm. community, the fan community of the prisoner has been amazing. Um, we've even, you know, we've tweaked a couple details in the figures and stuff because of the communication we've, we've had with people. Um, so we will do everything possible to make them available, um, you know, for, for a while. Okay, that's cool. I'm going to ask Doc, did you want to add anything to that? Um, well, no, no. I think it was a very comprehensive answer. Um, okay. we, 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 because of the, the reception, we really, we always hoped that we'd get to do Wave 2, and the reception has been so strong that we have every expectation now of doing a Wave 2. It won't come fast. We <laughs> want to... This is our first toy that we're manufacturing as a little indie startup company. We're going to go through the process. We're going to work with the factory. We're going to, you know, get the kinks out of the system. So uh, no one can expect a wave two this year. Uh -huh. um, but once fulfillment of wave one is done, uh -huh. it, we have every expectation of offering a wave two. Okay. Now, can you guys describe to me <coughs> your feelings, uh, you know, um, when you guys saw and touched the prototype um, <laughs> figure, can you guys describe that feeling? Well, I have to say because of uh, COVID, poor Doc has not been able to do that yet. Um, I, because of social distancing and, and the year we've all had. But I will say that when we got photos of the painted uh, – and. Uh, you know, I should I should mention uh, Louis Tucci, uh, Louis Tucci, who who sculpted it. You know, uh, he he sculpted in ZBrush. So for a while, this idea was virtual, right? We didn't have a um, a physical product. Mm -hmm. uh, but so we we you know for prototype purposes, we did the 3D print, and uh, a very talented uh, painter named Eddie came in and did the the, the painting job. And yeah, wh when we saw those photos of this thing. I, I mean, I, I was emotional about it. I was very moved and pleased. And when it arrived and I had it in hand, I was just so excited. Man. Oh, and I'm going to lord over it and hold on to it. And Doc may never see it. <laughs> Doc, I'm so sorry to hear about that. Oh, <laughs> oh. Now we've... I, I, I can't wait to have one of the figures we're doing is, is number six in the, the Rover 
you know, it's like a little Rover yeah. package on mm -hmm. for display. And I, I just, the day I put that on my desk and look back at it is going to be a very happy day. Um, so much so that I've, I've uh, made up my mind that Doc gets to keep the prototypes because of just the insane amount of work and love he's put into this. So he'll get them. Doc, what was your feeling about just seeing the pictures? Oh, just uh, amazing. Like the idea that we're actually, you know, that we're actually making this happen. I mean, yeah, it's mm -hmm. amazing. I'm excited. Um, I'm going to ask, um, because both of you guys are writers, have you guys toyed around with the idea of writing just a one-shot graphic novel, kind of a lost episode? Doc probably thinks about doing that every day of his life since about age 12, so. Yes, we've definitely <laughs> discussed how awesome that would be. Okay. Um, and Doc, if you do, you know, let me know, you know. <laughs> Going to be on Kickstarter, you got, you've got one supporter already, all right? All right. <laughs> That's awesome. Actually, and also, let me, also, let me mention to some of our comic book listeners, if they're kind of going, you know, um, the, the Prisoner has been um, in comic book form. Now, back in the 90s, DC did a four-part miniseries in those original graphic novels um, called The Prisoner um, Shattered Vis Visage, if I pronounce that word correctly. And then Titan Comics recently did um, a uh, four-part miniseries back in 2018 called The Uncertainty Machine, written by Peter Milligan. Um, also, to Titan, and if I remember correctly, I think Titan Comics released the Prisoner Art Edition um, that was done by Jack Kirby and Gil Kane. It was considered, and, and correct me if I'm wrong, it, it was, I believe it was supposed to be the, the that Jack Kirby wrote the, did a, um, the, Arrival, the pilot in comic book format. Correct. Uh, if anyone you did, have... that's correct. I have a. I'm looking at a copy right here next to me. Because I've seen some pictures. Like, oh my god, that's beautiful. It's the what? art is just stunning. Yeah. Yeah. I'm sorry, Doc. Were you going to say something else about that? About that um, art? Oh edition? no, it's it's absolutely gorgeous, and I have it right here at my fingertips. Yes. We, uh, you know, we, we are getting a lot of interesting, um, you know, just communication with backers. Uh, and we had a, a, a backer uh, just a couple days ago suggest, oh, you know, you guys should do figures based off of the comics. Mm -hmm. And like, how cool is that, right? Like thinking about, like if you think about like Star Wars expanded universe type stuff and like the Dark Horse, I was like, how cool is it that, that there could be and of course, my first thought was, oh, we have to do all the characters from the show first because the fans will kill us if we don't. <laughs> um, but how cool is it that there is a, kind of an expanded universe to the prisoner in that way? Oh, yeah. And then, and then, sorry, Gavin. And then one last thing for, you know, for um, just like for a pro, and I didn't know this, that there was a prose novel written back in 2005 called The Prisoner, The Prisoner's Dilemma. And it was written by Jonathan Blum and Rupert Booth. So if anyone's interested in continuing to want to read any more from, you know, past the TV series. So, but yeah, so I just wanted to let, have, you know. Have you read that doc? I have not, no. Yeah, I didn't know about that one actually. That's cool. I, I'll be honest with you, I didn't even know about it. I was going, I was Googling stuff on Amazon to, or just Googling stuff, just trying to make sure I got all my comic book information correct. And it was like, and I saw that, I was like, oh, okay. Yeah. So, all right. Um, what kind of official licensing figures would you guys like to see Wandering Plants do in the future? And it's such a like, like a first well, Superman. like uh, <laughs> like number two in the series. I, I will say that would be telling. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, the, rest assured that being big fans of a lot of things, Doc and I have had many, many, many conversations of. Wouldn't it be cool if, and, uh, you know, I, I hope now, uh, because the prisoner ha has seen such a positive response, we get to explore some other stuff uh, eventually. But we do, as collectors and fans, we want to make sure these are the toys that everybody wants, mm -hmm. you know, that they deserve. 
So we really are going to focus our attention for the next year on the manufacturing and the finishing. Uh, you've already seen the uh, just gorgeous package design that uh, Jenny, uh, has, our designer, has put together. So, you know, we're not going to get ahead of ourselves. We're really focused on, on making the prisoner figures that people have deserved for 50 years. And we think in doing that, we will, you know, secure the ability to explore other stuff later. Stock, did you want to add anything to that? Uh, no, that says it perfectly. Okay. All right. Now, um, because I'm slowly wrapping this up, do you guys have any last words about your prisoner kickstart campaign? Uh, just uh, that, yeah. Just that we are so thankful for the over 1,300 people so far that have pledged and backed the project. Um, it's so amazing to realize there are so many you know, fans of the prisoner who are also toy fans, who are willing to sort of get on board and get behind this and make this a reality. It is more support than we ever expected we would see. It is really awesome and that we are excited to um, get a chance to give these fans what they've been waiting for all this time. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I couldn't, I, you know, uh, exactly what Doc said. And we're just humbled and excited and uh, just, yeah, can't, can't wait to, to make them reality and, and everyone have them on their shelves and mm -hmm. in their hands. Um, it, it's been really cool. You know, I think we, we had hoped to make cool toys and, you know, for our fellow fans and friends who, who like this, mm -hmm. um, very quickly it's, it's becoming a, a little a community. And I don't know if I expected a, a, a community to form around uh, this mission of ours to make these. So that, that's been great. Um, and, you know, it's not too late for those, you know, who haven't backed. Um, we're working, as Doc said, on a really cool stretch goal that we hope to announce hopefully this week. Uh -huh. um, I think that, you know, like I said, there's, there's still some excite, excitement to come from this campaign. Uh -huh. um, and so, yeah, the next couple of weeks are going to be really exciting for us um, because we know we're funded. We know we get to make the toys we dreamed about. Uh -huh. um, and now it's just with, with every person who comes on and supports, it's okay. just getting that much better. <clears throat> So again, listeners, I'm going to let you guys know, I, you know, I already backed the project already. Oh, thanks, man. No, awesome. and no, but Doc, I'm going to blame you. I'm joking on this. I'm going to blame <laughs> you. No, it's either you or Gavin. You know, you guys talked about, because I, I um, now I got to go back in and get number six, the arrival action figure. Oh. You know? <laughs> <laughs> well, luckily he's an add-on and you can do it. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> All right, I'm sorry. One more question before we start wrapping things up. Uh, um, you know, uh, did, what was some of the fun experience? Uh, what was the cool things that you guys uh, experienced with the prisoner? Like, um, had you met, like, for example, did you guys meet any of the um, actors from the show? Doc, if I remember correct from John Suntra's, um interview that you actually, quote unquote, went to the village, right? Yeah, the series, the creepy little village that they, they shot in is a real village mm -hmm. and it's just charming and it's fantastic. It's a place called Port Marion, Wales. Mm -hmm. And yeah, I was in Dublin on business uh, for, for animated series uh, we were working on and I took the ferry over to Wales and drove down and stayed the night in the village and woke up in the morning in the village and just walked around and, and uh, you know, uh, took pictures in places where they shot scenes and uh, had an amazing time. It's, um, the whole village was built by one single architect as a pet project. It's all privately owned. Um, and so they, it's almost like a, you could buy like season passes to it if you're a local. Uh, they have little shops and they have restaurants and they have, uh, um, uh, you know, some other great sort of things to activities. They do a prisoner convention every year, but they also do a music festival there every year, an indie music festival called Festival Number no. 6 uh, that they do in Port Marion. It's, it's a great place to visit. I absolutely love it. Uh, and uh, you feel really connected. They have a bust of Patrick McNee, uh, sorry, of Patrick McGowan there. 
and they have and like there's the house that he stayed in when he was shooting there called the White House that you can visit and of course the apartment that was number six's apartment in the village and the Green Dome which was number two's residence yeah it's just it's amazing there's that beach where he tries to run away you can go out there it's really great when the tide is out you can go out there when the tide is in you're swimming <laughs> Gavin, what about you? Um, have you gone to any of the, the prisoner conventions or anything like that? Uh, you know, I have not. I, uh, like I said, I'm, I'm newer, uh, newer to the, to the fandom of prisoner in the last, you know, uh, five or so years. Um, but I will say, <clears throat> you know, being a, a super big fan of, of classic TV, uh, I have kind of made this new discovery to me uh, Patrick McEwen's relationship with Columbo, another classic series that that I love, and I've been watching. Why we've been in lockdown? I watch one a week, mm -hmm. and um, I just a couple weeks ago watched Patrick McEwen's first episode as a guest star on Columbo, mm -hmm. and it is phenomenal. I think he actually won a, a Emmy for his performance in it, and uh, so yeah, I would say uh, if you are a fan, and why wouldn't you be? Um, there's some fun places and performances, you know, that are not the prisoner mm -hmm. that yet, yet for people to enjoy. Um, Doc, I'm sorry, I'm going to, I'm going off the cuff. Have you been to any of the prisoner conventions? Uh, no, no, we were both going to go to one this year, oh. uh, or that, pardon me, last year that, uh, wound up being, um, not, uh, wound up uh, happening because of quarantine. Um, but uh, there's a great podcast called Eternal Village, and the team there uh, is planning on an event uh, at some point in the future, and uh, we, uh, we're going to try to make it out for that. Yeah, it'd be really, really fun for us to be able to, you know, how cool would it be to, you know, offer these figures in person, like at a convention environment where we could actually interact with people, and um, I look forward to, to that day. That'd be so cool. That'd be really cool. Okay, so I'm sorry. I'm, I'm going to start slowly wrapping things up. So um, are you guys, you know, um, are you guys able to talk about any upcoming projects that you guys are working on, whether it's a TV show, movie, comics, anything like that? Uh, I've, uh, with uh, my TV writing partner, Kevin Burke, we're producing a series for Hasbro and Netflix called Transformers Bot Bots. Mm -hmm. And it is a, uh, it is an 11 minute uh, comedy. It's the first ever Transformers comedy series and it's coming to Netflix. We don't have a drop date uh, yet, but um, we're in the middle of working on this show and we're really proud of it. Uh, and it's going to be a lot of fun. Okay, cool. Gavin. And then, uh, yes, yeah, speaking of uh, Netflix, I, uh, I can't say the, what it is, but I can say I've been working with their anime team mm -hmm. and have a new Netflix anime on the way. Uh, I'm very excited. Being a fan of uh, anime is, as well as a lot of stuff. Mm -hmm. um, this is a project that's being animated uh, in Japan by just the you know, most talented animators in the world. Um, so that will be coming, uh, I think 2022, okay. uh, really excited. It's a, it's a, we'll just say a video game IP. Mm -hmm. Uh, and then I have a, a, a graphic novel version of the concrete world, which we, we talked a little bit about earlier, my cyberpunk, uh, web comic, uh, all these years later, we're finally going to see the release of a graphic novel edition uh, probably this summer, it looks like, is when it's going to hit um, Concrete World. And uh, that that's, I mean, for me, a project 15 years in the making. So I'm really excited um, for people to be able to check it out. Okay. That's pretty cool, Gavin. Okay. So now we're going to go into the fun question part. So for oh, these have all been fun questions. Oh, okay. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you very much. <laughs> Thank you. Um, okay. How... How big are your guys' toy collection? <laughs> um, uh, that would be telling. <laughs> pr 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 pretty big. Um, yeah. Pretty big. I mean, yeah. do you have your own separate, do you have a separate room for it? 
Well, uh, if, uh, well, I could fill a separate room for it if the family were able to provide a room for me. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and my office is like, kind of like my nerd cave. So um, I've, it's, I need a TARDIS actually. I need something that's bigger on the inside because uh, I've, I'm kind of out of space, but um, yeah, I will say my, my favorite, the stuff I love, you know, um, is, is on the shelves of my office that I can, I can, you know, check it out, you know, during the day while I'm working and stuff. All right. Um, what is your prized possession toy or action figure? play set or whatever? Um, well, I guess I would say uh, my, uh, I have a, a Hot Toys Spider-Punk uh -huh. that uh, Marvel gave me when I was working on the Marvel Spider-Man show. And it is, I, I, is it my very, very favorite? I mean, I think it's gotta be. Um, it is like the detail of the figure, like the craftsmanship, it's amazing. But I also have a vintage um, 80s uh, sandworm from Dune in the box. Oh, yeah. I'm also, that's also one of my favorites. Those two are among my favorites. And then I think for me, you know, it's, it's, a, it's always changing, right? Like, you, yes. you know, you, you, you get excited about new things or new old things. Mm -hmm. um, right now, I, I would say that... Um, I am just absolutely obsessed with, uh, I, I'm sure you remember GoBots. Yes. Um, and, you know, in Japan, they were released as Machine Robo. Oh, no. And, okay. Yeah, so in Japan, you know, the, the, the toys called Machine Robo was the line. And there were some Machine Robo figures I had discovered a couple of years ago that I just, I love them so much. Mm -hmm. They're martial art ones. And so... Um, they don't, it's not like a robot that transforms into a car. Mm -hmm. It's a robot that folds up and you stick it inside of a car. So they're a little different. Um, but they, each one is a martial arts style. So there's judo robo, karate robo, kempa robo. And they're, they're rare in that they just are kind of unknown. So they're not really that valuable. Like if you can find one on eBay or something, they're, they're not crazy priced or anything, but they're just you so unique and they never made it to America as part of the GoBot line. Yes. And so Karate Robo and Judo Robo, I love them. And I don't even display the, like the vehicles they stick inside, just the little robot figures. They're die cast. Mm -hmm. um, I'm, I'm just, I love them. So I, I, right now those are my favorite toys. Mm -hmm. Okay. Now, for both you guys, what is your white whale? And what I and for listeners, what I mean by white whale is like, what is that one figure that you guys all that you guys want that you're always trying to look for that's hopefully reasonably priced? And I'm gonna give like for an example to our listeners, like like the missile firing Boba Fett from the 1980s prototype. And I think there are only six or I know there's like only six or seven million, you know. So either one of you guys start. I, I know that instantly. Um, for me, I always call that like my my Grail Cup toy, you know, <laughs> like, and uh, a, you know, a, appropriately so because for me, it's the Well of the Souls playset from Raiders of the Lost Ark that Kenner made. I've always wanted it. Um, it you know, it has a lot of little pieces, so finding one complete with a box, you know, I would want to like be able to display it with you know the figures. I wouldn't want to keep it mint or anything, yeah. but that that's one that has always evaded me because I'm pretty, I'm a bargain hunter and um, wow, what a neat little play set. I would love to have one of those one day. Uh, I, uh, I guess I will, I, I'm going to have to think and get back to you on the white whale. <laughs> That's fine. He actually wants the white whale toy from Moby Dick, which is really <laughs> weird. Yeah. That, uh, those yeah. were really rare, you know, <laughs> to find it new in box. But Gavin, I know what you mean by that. The um, the you know the well of soul, the Raiders of the Lost Ark, well of souls on place that I remember seeing that. Oh my God, that brought back memories. Uh, I'll tell you something that because I've been a collector my whole life. You know, like I went from being a kid playing with toys to a kid collecting them. Yeah. Um, so 
along my journeys, I've found some pretty neat deals and this will make other collectors um, cringe that it wasn't them. I once at a Toys R Us in Texas on a, on a family vacation, got the cargo truck, the, uh, from Raiders of the Lost Ark, the uh, alley, like the, the, the street market play set with like the, you know, the guy who had the little monkey yeah, yes. Um, and the map room playset, which is one of the neatest toys ever made. Mm -hmm. It's like the little map and Indiana Jones and like, you know, I got them all for I think like two forty nine a piece on clearance. <laughs> wow. Yeah. Yeah. And you know, I was a kid, right? I like like I you know, two forty nine even then felt cheap, you know, like as an adult, you're like, uh oh. I remember as a kid being like, I get that whole cargo truck for only two dollars and 49 cents and i still got it man and then doc i have to go back to your dune the sandworm i yeah. remember seeing that and you know when it when dune the original dune movie that came out back in the 80s i remember seeing that you know on the shelves and um i'll be on I, I did watch the movie it was kind of okay well for me it was kind of okay <laughs> But all I remember was those those sandworms, and I, <laughs> yeah. back then, you know, as a teenager in high school, I didn't have money. It looked so cool, I couldn't buy it. You know? Yeah. yeah. I think that's what drives us, right? That's what drives us is is those moments and the stuff we couldn't get. And as adults, we're like, I'm gonna I'm gonna take care of that now. <laughs> um, sorry, I'm kind of going off the cuff here. Have you guys backed any of the has um, the Haslab Kickstarters? You know, oh like, yeah. Jabba, the, <laughs> that, that, that sail barge, you know, or, or, um, well, uh, I know they did a Unicron. Yeah. Yes. Unicron. Yeah. Yeah. You guys backed up any of those projects? I, I'm just asking. Yeah. So I, I backed Unicron, um, you know, lifelong Transformers fan. I love the war for Cybertron toys. Uh, and I'm a biased cause I got to work on the show, <laughs> but, um, I just, uh, the 86 movie, I think. Yeah, 86 movie is the cornerstone of my Transformers love. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, I just, I had to make Unicron happen. So I definitely was on board for that. So did you get it yet or anything? Oh, yeah. And, and I have no idea where he's going to live because <laughs> of my space uh, issues. So um it's right now he's sitting like a fine bottle of wine waiting to be opened <laughs> and then doc what about you i have not back to haslab okay i i hovered over uh the razor's crest so many times oh, yes. because it was so beautiful I know. uh and uh, but uh, ultimately i didn't do it which was the right decision because at the end of the season you would have been disappointed yeah they <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to tell you guys, and I don't know how. Well, if Haslab, because I know they've done the Sentinel one. Yeah. Oh yeah. The X Men Sentinel. I'm going to say, if they ever do a Galactus one. Yeah, dude. I It'd be hard to how, say no to. I don't yeah. know. How I'm going to try to explain to my wife. <laughs> you know. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? I, I feel the same way. Um, Silver Surfer is one of my favorite comics. And uh, if, if I could get a, a gigantic uh, Galactus with like a cool like chrome Silver Surfer or something, sign me up. They did that. Uh, they did a, uh, the Heroclix line did a Galactus, which was pretty intense because, you know, Heroclix are like, what are they, one inch? scale yeah the tiny. galactus was like it was massive it, it's it, perfect it's right. appropriate yeah yeah all right sorry guys i'm gonna keep moving on sorry guys sorry i went off no track. worries <laughs> okay so any shout outs to any lcs or or, you know, or a small independent toy shop in your area oh wow well um a uh, huge shout out to big bad toy store um who because, you know, I, especially during the last year with lockdown, uh -huh. uh, it's hard to find stuff. I, you, you know, you have to be safe and not go out and social distance and stuff. So um, it's been nice through both has, uh, you know, uh, Hasbro Pulse and through Big Bad Toy Store to be able to, you know, every now and then have a package come in and, and yes. lift, lift my spirits while we're all dealing with what we've dealt with the last year. Uh, I shop at Emerald Knights in Burbank. 
Um, next question. Have you guys been to Hawaii? Yes. yes. <laughs> and, you know, you know, did you guys have a very good experience here? Or where did you go? My, fir my first ever trip to Hawaii, I was on a location scout for a film called Beneath that I produced, which eventually we wound up producing in Vancouver, Canada. Mm -hmm. uh, but we were producing, uh, we, we, there was a, a brief period in time when we thought we'd be producing it in Hawaii. Mm -hmm. And uh, so I, I, the studio flew me down, Paramount flew me down to do a location scout. And while we were there, we got hooked up with the uh, location uh, supervisor on Lost. Uh, mm -hmm. And he invited us out to do a set visit for Lost. Uh, and so we, no, don't wait, wait okay. for the ending. Okay. <laughs> we, we, um, uh, and we were excited to do that, but then we wound up having to have a meeting, a business meeting at that exact moment that was more important. And so we wound up not being able to accept the Lost set visit and instead did business. And we were like, oh, it's okay, because we're going to be shooting a whole movie here. We can go to set. We can visit those guys on set, you know, at some other time. And then when we got back to the States, the numbers didn't work to shoot in Hawaii. We wound up shooting in Vancouver. And I did not go back to Hawaii during the course of production of Lost and never got to visit the set. So that's my first visit to Hawaii. Doc, I'm sorry to hear about that. Yes. <laughs> oh, that's so sad. <laughs> It is. Um, I actually have a family uh, in Hawaii mm -hmm. and uh, did a visit maybe 10 or 12 years ago. And uh, I absolutely loved it. Uh, I love the people. I love the vibe. Um, I'm not really like a water sports beach kind of dude, but I just loved the, the culture of, of Hawaii itself and, and just the vibe. I'm one of my favorite things of all time is the classic Hawaii Five-O TV show. Mm -hmm. um, so it was very important for me to. Um, what's what's the mall there? All Al yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah. It was very important for me to go to that mall because, like, you know, walking in from one of the parking lots is a is a bust of Jack Lord, and I just I really wanted to see it because I, I love his work and that show so much. So, um, yeah, I, I look forward to the next time I can go back. Okay, and then. Um what is your favorite takeout place in your area? And what is your favorite dish from there? Uh, we've uh, got a place called Siam Cuisine here in Granada Hills. Uh, and it's all about the drunken noodles. And then for me, uh, uh, there's a restaurant in LA called Home State, which is Tex-Mex style tacos. And uh, growing up with a mother from the, you know, from Texas, I, it's, it's just like the food that I, you know, I don't get anymore, like home, home cooked, like Tex-Mex style. And uh, I, I don't think I could pick a favorite. I, I, uh, home state, man, I love everything on their menu. So um, if you're ever in LA, uh, uh, kind of the Silver Lake area, I highly recommend it. Great. And then um, can you guys promote the Kickstarter and your social media platforms once again to our listeners. Sure. So Wandering Planet Toys uh, is on, there's a Facebook page. Uh, there's an Instagram, which is Wandering Planet underscore toys, I believe. And then we are on Twitter at Wandering Planet. And our Twitter is super active. Please follow us there. Mm -hmm. um, and Instagram's fun. We'll be previewing a lot of the process of making these toys over the next year um, on that Instagram. What about you? Uh, and I, I'm on Twitter at Otherland71. Any last words to our listeners? Uh, just thank you for a great interview and a really uh, enjoyable time talking about all this stuff. And it's, it's been fun, man. And if you haven't checked out The Prisoner Show, uh, it, you know, it, it's check out The Arrival. You can find it online, various places for free. And uh, you can even go on IMDb and click on it and IMDb TV. We'll bring you to the episodes for free. Uh, start with The Arrival. It's the first episode. And just check it out. Man, it's a great show. All right, guys. You know, again, you know, thank you, Doc and Gavin. Thank you very much for your time. And thank you for sharing your love you know, of this classic TV show, The Prisoner. And also, too, thank you for sharing your love of you know, 
toys and action figures. Thank you very much. You know, um, easy to do, man. Yeah. Thank you. And then to our listeners, you know, if you can't afford to please, you know, support, you know, this Kickstarter, you know, it ends on May 26. Um, I also want to give a big thank you to, again, to David Hyde of super fan promotions for setting up this interview. So David, thank you very much. You know, thank you, sir. Um, and I also want to thank Drew, the co-host for the Comics for Fun and Profit podcast, for putting this episode together. Drew, thank you very much for all your hard work. Drew is the guy who, you know, who, who, you know, um, he needs to do any editing. He does that. He all he does all the heavy lifting. He's going to make us sound smarter. I like that. <laughs> <laughs> um, and then finally, I want to thank you, the listeners, you know, for your time. Thank you very much for listening to this episode. Until next time, guys, aloha. 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 All right, I'm, let me, I'm going to stop recording. <laughs>